John Henry when he was a baby Sat down on his mammy's knee Picked up a hammer in his little right hand That's gonna be the death of me Hammer be the death of me Dr. Wiesner received his doctorate in electrical engineering from the University of Michigan. It was Archibald McLeish, then head of the Library of Congress, who invited him to establish and operate a recording and acoustics laboratory within the library. And now, 30 years later, what would Archibald McLeish say of Jerome Wiesner? Ladies and gentlemen, I ask Mr. McLeish to step to the lectern. I have called these lines speech for an occasion. The occasion, obviously, is this one. And I have dedicated them to the occasion of the occasion, Jerry Wiesner. Rinsing our mouths with praise. Tin cup by the limestone spring in the cool of the mint bed. Earlier generations knew this place made their way here thronging. We have forgotten it. We have kept to the streets too long, tongues stale, hearts thirsty. Oh, to praise God's will in the world, if we could learn it, test it on our lips, would taste of praise. Why else should the world be beautiful? Why should the leaves look as they do, the light, the water? Rinsing our mouths with praise of a good man. I say what I mean. I do not say a good man in a bad time. All times are bad when the man fails them. I say a good man in a time when men are scarce, when the intelligent foregather, follow each other around in the fog like sheep bleat in the rain, complain because Godot never comes, because all life is a tragic absurdity, Sisyphus sweating away at his stone, and this rock won't. Because freedom and dignity, oh, weep, they say, for freedom and dignity. You're not free, it's your grandfather's itch you're scratching. You have no dignity, you're not a man, you're a rat in a vat of rewards and punishments. You think you've chosen the rewards, you haven't. The rewards have chosen you. I weep, rinsing our mouths with praise of a good man in a time when men are scarce, when the word chirps like a cricket on the cellar floor, on the damp stone, and the mind maunders. A good man, look at him there in the fog, look. He saunters along to his place in the world's weather, lights his pipe, hitches his pants, talks back to accepted opinions. Congressional committees hear him say, not what you think, what you haven't thought of. He addresses presidents. He says, governments even now still have to govern. No one is going to invent a self-governing holocaust. The Pentagon receives his views. Science, he says, is no substitute for thought. Miracle drugs, perhaps, not miracle wars. Advisor to presidents, the papers call him. Advisor, I say, to the young. It's the young who need competent friends, bold companions, honest men who won't run out, won't write off mankind, sell up the country, quit the venture, jibe the ship. In Cambridge, off that drive, it's uh, it's still under Cambridge Police. It's just to help each other. Greetings, sir. The professor from Berkeley come to give us some help. Where is where is Ben? Ben is up at the eye lab. Oh, well, up where the action. One in a car. Yeah. And he will come and say what the rights are good. and tell them all of this. One car, one cop. Great. And that will be sometime within the next five to ten minutes. It's always bad. It's trouble. You better stay the fuck out of the way because people are going to be coming that way, okay? You don't 
have to actually go out and ask every student, you know, what's your opinion on this issue? A lot of them aren't going to have opinions on any random issue that you pick. But you've got to at least say, we are about to make a decision on this kind of thing. Anybody who's interested, you know, please submit comments. Now, three years ago, this institute went to a big decision of should we have a medical school? I didn't know about it. I've been here five years, and all of the time I was here, nobody even suggested that we were going through that kind of a discussion. Why not? Why weren't you students... Want to know why not? Yeah. Because we had to answer in four days. And because we had, you know, it was obvious that we couldn't afford to. <laughs> and did it make a whole lot of sense to have a big exercise and frustration? And should we or shouldn't we have a medical school that we didn't have the $100 million that was going to take the bill? The only way we could say yes is if we could find somebody who would match the government money with 50, a promise of $50 million cash. And Dr. Killian and I said, let's try. And then we can, and we hit five people that we knew, or ex people, I don't know. And then we finally talked to people, some we couldn't even reach, who we thought were interested enough in medical schools, MIT, and a whole other thing to see whether anyone was willing, you know, to say, sure. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and they, nobody did. <laughs> this was five days after Howard became president of this institution. The, the six months before, we had been totaling up the bill on what we thought it was going to, where we were going to have to raise to do the things we thought already had to be done to keep the promises that had been made, like dormitories and new buildings and so on. And that came to $200 million that we didn't have. You know, and I don't see why that kind of a decision has to be put to a popular referendum. And in fact, I don't think it has to be put to a popular Jerry, referendum. I think you just have to say that, that you're making it so that... I made a decision. Well, that's true. Well, who knows? One of the students might have known somebody with $50 million in his back pocket. I mean, all right. I mean, that's all. We're faced with a question of whether the decisions about today make sense for this kind of group. I think it's fine to go into the other things, but I think we also ought to come to some understanding as to whether or not we're involved in a decision-making process that makes sense, or is this another medical school deal? I love this man. I rinse my mouth with his praise in a frightened time. The taste in the cup is of mint, of spring water. By the authority of the corporation and with the enthusiastic approval of the faculty, the alumni, and the student body, and of this distinguished assembly, I present into your keeping this charter of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and invest you with all of the authority, privileges, and responsibilities of the Office of President. May you, Jerry, serve the Institute and dignify its office of president with all of the skill, wisdom, and dedication which our confidence accords to you. And may your administration be memorable. Thank you, MIT's Pride of Presidents. 
an old friend, Archibald McLeish, for this honor and this challenge. And you, Paul Gray, as you become a legal chancellor, for being willing to share the burden and joys of leading this great institution. And a special thanks to Priscilla Gray and to my wife, Leah, for so willingly taking the plunge with us into the unknown and exciting, but obviously demanding future. Dear friends, thank you all for this occasion. And I might just say in passing, Dr. Killian has made me realize that I had something to look forward to. <laughs> Retirement.